Good afternoon and welcome to Tim Royers, Legislative Candidate from District 31. Thank you, Tim, for joining us today for our virtual legislative candidate meetings. My name is Gina Raglin, and with us today are lead advocacy ARP volunteers, Susan DeCamp, Bob Lassen, and Mike Barwig. Emily Wick is also joining us from the ARP State Office. Tim, we appreciate your time and taking the time to meet with us to discuss issues of importance to the 50 plus voter and their families in Nebraska. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared with AARP members across your district prior to the election. So Tim, if you wanna start by giving us a little background about yourself and your campaign, again, in a five minute or less would be great. And once we've completed your opening, then we'll move into the questions. So again, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, my name is Tim Royers. I have been living in this community since I was 10 years old. My family originally, we came from the suburbs of Chicago and we moved out here um, in the mid 90s and, and I've been here ever since. Um, my wife grew up in this di district. Um, both of my girls were born here in the district. My parents and my in-laws who are all re you know, retired, most of them are retired. Um, they live here in the district too. So this this district really is home for me. And that's one of the main things that motivated me to run um, was I've had a wonderful experience growing up uh, here. And now that I have two girls um, who are going to school and I have you know, my parents and in-laws living here, I wanna, I wanna make sure this community remains a great place for everybody to live. Um, and I know that we have strong, com strong communities are not by accident. Um, they require uh, hardworking representatives to make sure that they stay strong communities. Um, the other half of what motivated me to run is uh, for the past decade or so, uh, I have served as the chief negotiator for the Millard Education Association, representing teachers in writing salary and benefits. Um, and through my advocacy work there, I've learned that a lot of the challenges that we were trying to address really didn't exist at, this, at the local level. They existed more at the state level. Um, and so I wanted then to elevate the level that I was able to advocate uh, at from, you know, from the local level down to the, to the state house in, in Lincoln. Um, and the final piece was, you know, uh, Rick Kalaski has been the state senator here for the district for eight years. Um, he has been a strong advocate for the area that I'm most passionate about, which is education. Um, and I wanted to kind of keep that, that going um, and to make sure that there was, you know, somebody who is living and working in the district, who owns a home in the district, you know, to continue to represent the district and all the, the myriad of issues that are presented there. And so that's really what motivated me to run. Um, and, and those are, you know, the main issues uh, as a teacher and as a parent of kids, you know, school is, is the area that I'm most passionate about, but there are certainly a number of areas um, that overlap with the, with the questions and the major topics that, that you all are addressing too that we'll talk about here in a minute. So that's my brief background. Great, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, moving into the questions, and we have provided you with a set of three questions pertaining to the 50 plus in Nebraska. And again, we've allotted five minutes for each of those. Um, our first question today comes from Mike Barwick, who you'll see on the screen here. Mike is one of our volunteers. Um, his question is gonna address helping people stay in their homes and communities. So go ahead, Mike. <coughs> Excuse me. Good afternoon, and might I just say that I grew up in Chicago Heights, Illinois. Oh, okay, so right on. <laughs> so a livable community is one that is safe and secure, has housing that is affordable, which means no more than 30% of income is spent on the housing, transportation options that allow individuals to travel by multiple means, and supportive community features and services for people of all ages, allowing people to remain in their communities as they age. The question is, what steps will you take to ensure all Nebraskans have access to livable communities? So I'm starting my timer. I want to make sure I respect the five minutes. Um, so there's obviously a lot of depth and areas that go into that, that topic, right? Because it's like you said, it's, it's not just about mobility. It's also about, you know, affordable housing and being able to, and again, to me, the most important thing and the bottom line for me as a policymaker is that ultimately the decisions about where you live and what you do should be based on your choice. No one should feel compelled. No one should feel forced to leave the community that, they, that they've lived in for decades simply because it's now become unaffordable for a number of reasons. Or no one should feel forced to leave their community because they lack access to transportation that they can utilize to get to the places that they need to go. So ultimately, in my mind, as a policymaker, we need to be doing what we can to make sure that people feel comfortable with deciding to stay in the community that they've lived in for a while, or if they feel it's time to move to a new location, that they do so. But again, the key is that it's of their own volition. So there's four 
kind of main things that I want to talk about that I feel address this issue of being able to choose to stay within your community. First, you, you, you alluded to transportation, and especially out in West Omaha, there's not really a lot of transportation opportunities at all. Um, and this is, I, I'm an avid bicyclist, uh, I enjoy running, uh, and even those two pieces are difficult to do in West Omaha. And so, um, to me, we need to expand the kind of public funding that we offer, um, and we need to make sure that when we talk about, you know, expanding public transportation, like the rapid bus system that's being developed more in the eastern part of town, we need, that can't be limited to just certain clusters or certain areas of Omaha, it needs to be made accessible for all areas of Omaha because we don't stay confined to just, you know, one neighborhood or one, you know, locality within town. So to do that, to me, we need to expand infrastructure banks. To me, infrastructure banks are a great tool to help expand access to public transportation and other methods of transportation without significantly burdening uh, the state budget, right? Because that's going to be the loaded issue this year is what can we do on a very limited state budget? Infrastructure banks allow provide a, a source of funds, uh, you know, with low with low interest return to fund transportation and other infrastructure projects. And to me, this is a tool that we should be expanding. We already have infrastructure bank access in Nebraska, but it needs to be used more. The other thing we need to do is we need to be more willing to expand public private partnership to provide these opportunities and transportation services to folks, um, because again, Businesses in the community recognize the value of, me, of providing accessible transportation options within the community. They understand that in order to keep people here, which is critical to our tax base and to our spending base, it has to happen. Businesses are eager to be a part of it, so we need to make sure that we're crafting a tax code and crafting an incentive structure that helps get them on board as partners. The third thing we need to look at is working with our real estate development partners on zoning and requirements for affordable housing so to make sure that those prices stay reasonable but the fourth and final thing that i'll say and i'm gonna i'm saving the bulk of my time for this is we need to address fundamentally the property tax and school funding issue and this is where education may not seem like it's a major issue for 50 plus but it absolutely is even before the pandemic started i knocked on over seven thousand doors and property taxes and education were the top two issues that I heard from everybody. And it was on a sliding scale. So the older the folks got, what I heard, the message I heard was, we love our schools, we don't want that to change, but I'm on a fixed or limited income. And the continued increase in property taxes is making it so that I have to choose not just to move out of West Omaha, but to move out of Nebraska. And so to me, we need to finally resolve this issue and have the state provide the consistent funding for our schools that they deserve so that way we can dial down how reliant there's only one other state in the country that relies on property tax to funded schools more than nebraska and in millard and i'm very proud of the fact that i've been a part of this you know writing this i've written over a billion dollars in salary and benefits for millard public schools over a decade we're the second most cost efficient district in the state we have fewer teachers now in millard than we did 10 years ago so to me, it's not an issue of school spending. We are as, about as lean as you can possibly get in Millard. And so to me, this really does, this is about, we need the state to provide more funding so that way we can dial down how reliant we are on property taxes at the local level. And I'm talking even, you know, lowering um, the percentage of market value we use to assess, you know, that's an option that we can look at. I'm willing to look at all options on the table, but we need to do both. We don't just need to provide more funding at the state level for schools. We need to reduce the property tax burden because it is too high. And I've seen firsthand talking to voters in the community what it has done to their ability to budget. These are people who have paid off their homes mm -hmm. and yet they still feel financially constrained because every year they see property taxes going up. So those four things, infrastructure banks, expanding public private partnership, uh, working on zoning and, and affordable housing requirements, and finally, providing su substantial property tax relief. Those are the four things I think we should be doing to make sure that our communities are affordable and accessible for all ages. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, our second question, we're gonna switch gears a little bit into health caregiving and home and community-based care. And, and Susan DeCamp is gonna take that question. So go ahead, Susan. Hi, Tim, it's nice to have you with us today. Caregivers help older persons live independently in their homes by providing assistance with activities such as bathing, dressing, and performing medical and nursing tasks such as administering medicines. Caregivers often provide these services with little or no training and oftentimes with little or no uh, compensation. So I have a two-part question for you, keeping that in mind. Would you support helping caregivers with things such as paid leave, 
respite services, telehealth, and access to education and training? And secondly, if elected, how would you protect or expand paid services and supports, as well as financial security that allows more seniors to live independently in their homes? Yeah, this is, this is a great, th those are both great issues that need to be addressed. And, and to, to the first more specific question about will I support that? Yeah, absolutely I will. Um, because those pieces are key to drawing people into the industry and making sure that we have high quality, you know, high quality, high qualified people that are providing these services for folks. Um, and, you know, I've seen firsthand the importance of in home care. Now it's, it's on the opposite end of the spectrum, right? It's, I have, uh, I have a neighbor that lives right next to me that receives in-home pediatric care. But to me, the value is exactly the same as what you're describing, right? And, and to be able to have, and, and their care is 24 hours, right? So they, there's always someone in the home because their youngest needs constant support. And I've seen firsthand why it's critical to have qualified people who know what they're doing, who can be a, you know, a source of stability in those folks' lives. Um, because it also frees you up to do the other things that you want to do, right? If there's people there that you know that can that can take care of your your medical and health needs, um, then not only does that help you, but it helps give your family peace of mind, right? Because they know that there's people they can rely on to support them in the home. It also, again, to go back to what I said on the first question, it also helps the autonomy issue because if you feel that you can you know get that care in the home, once again. That, uh, that empowers you to make the decision whether or not you want to stay in the same home you've been living in for a long time, or if you want to move into, you know, an assisted living facility, wherever, right? And this is something that, you know, I watched, um, you know, my, my grandfather passed away several years ago, but he lived close to us and I watched him move through kind of the spectrum of care, right? And so, you know, as, you know, as he got older um, and, and he had, as he had additional health needs develop. And so I've seen at every step of the way, why it's, because I've seen good examples firsthand and bad examples firsthand of care. Um, and so absolutely, I would support that. I also think, I've heard from other uh, medical groups, uh, the importance of looking at reviewing the 407 process that Health and Human Services has for who, should, who can even provide certain services in the first place, because what I've heard frustration from a number of groups, from optometrists to nurses to others, that uh, right now the system that we have in place to review who can provide services and who can't, is laborious, it, it does not serve the needs of the providers or the patients, and that we need to overhaul that system so that way we can be more flexible and nimble and make sure that we're getting folks in there that, that, that can provide those services in a reasonable way. So that would be a specific example, Susan, of something that I would like to look at. And to me, I'm looking for examples like that because again, one of my larger concerns is there's not going to be a lot of money available in terms of budget discussions next year, not only from the state, but also private businesses don't have a lot of money to play around with right now because we're still dealing with the aftermath of the pan, well, not aftermath, because we're still dealing with the pandemic, right? We're still dealing with the fall ongoing fallout of the pandemic. And so to me, something like overhauling the 407 process so we can get, so we can open up who has access to provide these services, if, they're, if, if medical professionals agree they're qualified and should be in there, that to me is low hanging fruit that we can tackle that can kind of get to the, to the question at hand. To the second question or to the second part of your question about, you know, providing services, if there is a silver lining to this pandemic, it's taught us that there are, there are more tools available and we should be fully utilizing them to expand access to service. And of the things that you mentioned, one specific thing that I really want to work on is expanding access and providing more consistent access to telehealth. Uh, I think that that's really, really important. I think, it's all, I think it's critically important to the larger question of being able to stay in the home and still get the, the health care that you deserve. Um, I think that it's, again, something that we can push that does not have a large dollar sign to, attached to it. Um, but I think it's going to take a lot more than just the folks that are that are listening to this right now to make it happen because it's going to require partnering with the telecom industry because if you don't have access to the internet infrastructure then i can talk about the greatness of telehealth until i'm blue in the face but if you don't have a stable internet connection in your home then what's the point uh and so to me this is where we really need to bring multiple industries on board but i again i have seen firsthand the power of telehealth, and, and, and we call it telehealth, but really it's, it's, it's more Zoom health, right? Because well, the examples that I saw were doctors being able to get on the call with patients at home and directly talk to them. And, and that distinction is important because there's, not a, there's a lot that you can't pick up on when you're talking on the phone with someone, but being able to see them and being able to see the conditions in the home and being able to see physically how they're reacting as you're talking through issues, what they look like, 
that to me is really what has made telehealth, telehealth has been discussed for decades, but really I think we're finally at the point now where it's a viable tool for people to have access to where it maybe wasn't before. Uh, and so, you know, that specific, uh, in principle, I agree with everything you said on that second part of the question, but just so you all know, the specific piece that I would really love to advocate for is expansion of telehealth access and making sure that providers are properly supported for providing telehealth, right? That's the other side of the coin that we need to make sure that we're addressing as well. So yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Great, thanks for your answers, Tim. Great, and we I just have to interject. I appreciate your thoughts very much on the telehealth, Tim, and the, the payment parity is the other piece. I think that, and you kind of alluded to that at the end too, but yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's shown, I think, if anything's come out of the pandemic that it has worked and we did have yep. that. And so we need to continue down that path. So I do very much appreciate your thoughts on that. So thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. um, our third question and last question, then we're gonna switch over to nursing facility quality and Bob Lassen is going to take that one. So go ahead, Bob. Hey, yes, thank you, Tim, for, for coming today. Um, an estimated 6,600 plus Nebraskans reside in one of Nebraska's 211 nursing homes. By 2040, the University of Nebraska Omaha projects that number will more than double to almost 14,000 people. Due to a variety of factors over the past few years, uh, Nebraska has seen an increase in nursing home facilities that have had to close. Uh, that results in the, uh, the residents in those particular facilities having to relocate um, at a time that's pretty, pretty difficult for them. Uh, how will you ensure that Nebraska residents receive quality nursing home care, including ensuring an adequate nursing workforce, education and training, and proper reimbursement? Yeah, that's a hugely important topic. Um, there's a lot of different ways I can go with this one, but I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the one that I really want to talk about that I feel is the, the biggest piece that we need to address on this issue. And that is the, the, uh, the reimbursement gap for Medicaid. I think that is by far the biggest issue that we need to address when we talk about nursing home care. I know that the Medicaid contract is coming up. Um, and, and so, and I want to say this because I've mentioned several times so far on this for, for folks that are watching this, I've said several times that I'm worried about how much we can do because I know that the budget situation is going to be a, a little uneasy uh, as we deal with, again, pandemic fallout. However, I also want to say that if, if we commit dollars anywhere, right, we have to make sure we're committing dollars to narrowing the reimbursement gap between the cost of providing services. And, I, I'm, and I'm going to say narrow because it'd be very easy for me to say eliminate, but that's not a realistic thing for me to say, right? And I wanna make sure that when I'm talking on the issues, I'm talking about things that we can realistically do, which is why I've talked about telehealth and infrastructure banks. So those are things that I think that we can plausibly get done. And in an ideal world, we close the rate gap. I don't think we can do that with the money that's available, but we need to at least commit to narrowing the reimbursement gap with what Medicaid is providing. Um, and I think it's critical because you mentioned closure of facilities. One of the things that really concerns me is the vast majority of those facilities that have closed are rural facilities because they lack the economy of scale. They lack the amount of, they, they, they lack the sufficient amount of people who are privately paying for their, for, for their uh, space in the nursing homes, right? To make up for the fact that the Medicaid beds are not providing enough dollars for those, for those facilities. Um, and, and to me, this is a huge issue for everyone because time and time again, what have nursing homes said? Uh, in terms of, you know, okay, well, the gap exists. How do you cope with it? Well, they say every time, well, they increase what they charge the private payers to compensate for the fact. So even if you aren't using Medicaid to have access to a nursing home for yourself or to have access to a nursing home for a loved one, every single person is paying for the fact that we are not properly reimbursing people through Medicaid, um, whether you're privately insured or not. And so to me, this is the, the number one issue because one, because it solves the uh, workforce issue because now people are getting the, the dollars that they deserve for providing the care that, they, that they're offering. It's going to see, uh, it's gonna hopefully see a reduction of costs for those folks who are able to pay privately for the services in the nursing homes. This, this is the gateway issue to everything else. To me, before we talk about any other uh, ancillary issues with nursing homes, we have to address reimbursement rate gap with Medicaid. Um, and, and that to me is the, you know, we, we talk about the big spenders in the state budget, right? K-12 obviously is, is important, but to me, health and human services is right up there. And, and to me, this, this, this isn't just an, 
this isn't just an economic issue. I, I mentioned the cost for private. To me, it, budgets are moral documents, right? They, they, are, they are a demonstration of where you are committing your dollars and what you care about. And, and again, having seen firsthand the importance of, you know, there were times where, you know, my, my grandfather was incredibly lucky. We were able to, there's only so many spots available for Medicaid patients, right? And so we had gotten to that point. We had gotten to that point in his life where we had exhausted all the funds that had been saved. And by virtue of luck, a spot was available at an excellent nursing home facility using Medicaid. And again, it goes back to what I said at the start with the other questions. It should be a choice. It should not be based on luck. It should not be based on what, you know, you shouldn't be forced to make a decision. And he did everything right. You know, he worked until he physically couldn't work anymore. He saved for retirement. He did everything he could. And it was a choice between finding a facility through Medicaid or blowing through the savings of his children. And no one should feel forced to do that, right? That's, to me, that's just, it's morally bankrupt that you have to force families to choose between potentially going in debt or even bankrupt to provide care for people who deserve it because they've lived a long life or getting lucky with access to Medicaid. So reimbursement rate is, is, is the huge priority for me because that will expand access. It'll provide better quality care and it's gonna be a heavy lift, which is why it's the only thing I'm talking about because I know it's gonna be a huge battle in appropriations, but I'm telling you right now, that's a mountain I'm willing to die on, right? Because to me, it, it, it is a huge chain issue for everything else. So if nothing else, you have my commitment, I will fight to address the reimbursement gap. That's a huge priority for me. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, we're coming now to the end of our meeting and our time. And so I, I do appreciate, again, all the time you've spent with us today thus far. Uh, but for the final minutes we have, I want to offer you um, any closing thoughts, comments, or messages you want to send to your constituents. So go ahead and have the floor back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, all of you for organizing this again. Thank you very much. Thank you to anybody that's, that's, that's watching or listening right now. Um, the final things I want to say is this. You know, I, I've said my focus is as a teacher and as a young parent, right, that that's kind of my focus. Um, but to me, that has an absolute connection to your concerns about people 50 and older in the community, because one of the major things we had to do is we have to keep young Nebraskans in Nebraska, right? One of the major ways we can make sure we are properly funding services for people as they get older in life is that we have a s significant young population to fund those pieces, right? And every year we lose thousands of 20 something Nebraskans leave Nebraska and don't come back. And I know that that statistic is true because I teach high school kids, right? And I stay in touch with my former students. I've taught for 11 of the 13 years at Millard West, I taught the top, in the top of the class student. To my knowledge, only two of them are left in Nebraska. The rest are out of state. That has to stop. And again, that's an issue that affects everybody across all spectrum of age, right? The final thing I'll say is this, I know I'm a first time candidate, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to anybody that knows me because one thing that I'm going to commit to you is you will not find somebody who works harder than me. I am a giant data nerd. I love to research, look, read white papers, look at spreadsheets. I promise to get into the details because it's the details where the consequences of good or bad policy are really made, right? It's, it's not in broad pronouncements. It's not in, you know, vague promises about, you know, committing to do X. It's about when, when you get down to the bills and you're looking at page 12, paragraph three, what's in there that makes or breaks it. I'm the person that raises his hand and says, let's talk about this because I'm not sure if the wording's quite right. That's the kind of person I am. I'll be, I'll, I'm the person that's up till one in the morning doing that kind of stuff. So I promise you will not find a harder working person than me to take on this position. So thank you very much. I appreciate the chance uh, for you to, to, to listen to me talk about these policies and, uh, yeah, thanks again. That's just all I can say. I'm grateful for the Excellent. opportunity. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you again for visiting with us, Tim. We wish you the best with your campaign. And again, our great thanks for meeting with ARP Nebraska today. Take yep. care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.